Hello everyone, my name is Always Asmal, welcome to another episode of Two Ways to Skin a Cat, a show where we talk career experiences, entrepreneurship and investments. The main aim is to show that there's more than one way to be successful other than just climbing the corporate ladder. We are live on LinkedIn and YouTube and the show will be available on podcast by tomorrow. For those of you who have watched quite a few of these episodes, if you know anyone else who would benefit from watching, please share it with at least one person. Now, if you're joining us live, please drop a one in the comments so that we know we're not talking to ourselves and drop a two in the comments if you're watching the recording. My guest for this week is Travis Fisher, a chartered accountant working in audit who moved to the USA and then qualified as a certified public accountant or a CPA. Travis, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks, you guys. I'm very much uh, looking forward to this and it's a great honor to be here with you and your, your, your followers. Awesome. It's, so let's jump straight into the meat of the story. Tell us your story, where do you come from, and even outside of work, who is Travis Fisher? Give us that backstory. Absolutely. Um, so I was initially, I was born in uh, Durban, uh, KZN. Uh, as a true Durbanite, uh, I love the outdoors, I love the weather. Um, fortunately, I didn't have to go very far um, from where I grew up because I went to school, studied, and eventually worked. Uh, within about a 10 kilometer radius in the in the um, Schlange area. Um, I come from a, a family of entrepreneurs with both my dad and grandfather being entrepreneurs. So I was always exposed to finance, business uh, from an early age. And I think my dad was never too shy uh, to have my brother and myself uh, involved in some discussion around business. Uh, and especially as we started studying uh, accounting at school. Uh, growing up, um, people always tell you I was always scheming uh, about how to make a few bucks here and there. Uh, and I actually got connected at just 15 years old to becoming a uh, agent or a reseller for a French water ski brand uh, in South Africa at the time. Um, I don't think they knew I was 15 years old at the time, but it was it was really successful for a number of years. Um, and that's kind of outside of accounting and finance. Uh, I've had a career as a competitive water skier, uh, having competed all around the world at World Championships. Uh, I'm the co-holder of a South African national record. Um, so anytime outside of work, uh, it's pretty much been at the lake over the last 15 years. Um, and then outside of, out of the water skiing side, I've always loved anything tech, uh, anything computer related and uh, Work colleagues will tell you I'm always trying to get them to use the next audit automation, come up with the next formula. Um, and I've actually worked very closely over the last few years with the um, action camera company GoPro and won a number of international awards uh, on the photography side and videos uh, with them and even been featured in, in some of their marketing uh, materials. So that's a little bit more on the, on the personal side uh, from a career perspective. Uh, initially studied through NISA, did the four-year program um, to allow me to become a CASA. Um, and obviously studying through NISA, that was super helpful because I could come and spend time in the US. Uh, obviously with NISA being correspondence. Um, and during that time in the US, I could train for water skiing. Um, so that's always been a, a big part of, of my journey is, is the sporting aspect. Um, and then I did my articles at BDO uh, in Durban, finished up in 2020 always wanted to move abroad uh, after articles. Unfortunately, COVID came in and, and threw havoc in those plans. Um, and then, uh, so I worked remotely uh, for a year through Sapro, which I know a lot of people have been doing the last three years. Um, and they outsourced me to DHG, which is a, a mid-tier firm here on the East Coast. Um, and then in the end of 2021, I got connected back with BDO here in the uh, Tampa office. and. Six weeks later, I arrived and I've been here in the U.S. since early 2022. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, tell me, uh, I mean, CSA has recently been voted the number one accounting destination in the world. Most people who move overseas, they tend to trade on their CSA qualification. Yet you took the next step to qualify as a CPA. Uh, maybe tell us about your thinking behind that decision. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think for me, I always knew when I became a CASA, when I wrote that final board exam, I always knew that um, if I wanted to be successful in the US, I had to have the US qualification as much as we know it's, it's you know, a really great degree. 
Uh, unfortunately, the US doesn't recognize it as much. Um, and certainly, I think over the past few years, that's changed quite a lot. Um, but for me, obviously, wanting to live here in the US permanently and ultimately to grow and to grow up the corporate ladder to become uh, now an audit manager, that was one of the requirements. Um, so for me, that was always a, a no brainer, uh, put myself, you know, aligned with the rest of the, the people I'm working with. So definitely was an important aspect to, to keep growing. Okay. And maybe tell us a little bit about the differences between the CASA qualification and CPA. And, um, yeah, was it a difficult process? Like, did, do they give you any credits or anything, or did you have to start from the bottom? Yeah, so fortunately, the one thing nowadays is that SICA have a mutual agreement uh, with the US. In other words, it allows you to convert uh, your South African CA to the US CPA. Uh, so traditionally, uh, the US CPA is written in four parts, um, with one part being regulation, which is the exam that uh, I took. Um, so having the CASA qualification, that allowed me just to take the regulation exam, so I didn't have to take the other three parts. Um, and in terms of the exam, uh, it's quite it's quite interesting coming from uh, South Africa, where a lot of the exams, especially when other than my board exam, it was all handwritten stuff. You had these long, lengthy answers. You were taking the tax act with you. Uh, whereas here, the exam is pretty much is all multiple choice. Um, so there's a, a score of seventy five percent you need to pass that exam. Wow. Um, and it, again, it seems high, um, but yeah. It's that a lot of people do it. Um, and being a CASA, I always said, if you could become a CASA, you can become a US CPA for sure. Um, so yeah, fortunately for me, it was just one exam that I converted uh, and then I got registered in, in Florida. So every state has slightly different requirements, uh, but I was able to get registered uh, here in Florida. So, so what does that mean? Does that mean you can't use your CPA qualification outside of Florida or, or is it maybe tell us a little bit there? Um, okay, so that it just depends the different states you're going to work in. Uh, but generally, if you're working at one of the big accounting firms, they require you, if you're working in Florida, to be registered in Florida. Um, and certainly, if you want to sign off, ultimately, reports down the line, you need to be registered in that state. Um, so, so those are kind of the, the big things. But right, right now where I'm at, it doesn't make too much of a difference, but certainly going forward, um, that, that would be a factor. Okay, okay. For the audience, we'll be responding to questions towards the end. So please add your questions to the comment section now so that we don't miss them. Maybe talk to us about your, your move to the US specifically. When I looked at your LinkedIn profile, it's not like you said, okay, one day uh, I'm going to move to America and the next day you're there. There was seemed to be a bit of a transition period. I know you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Sapro, but uh, talk to us about how long the journey was, uh, how long should it normally take as an example? Yeah, for sure. Um, so for me, um, I initially started working with Sapro in the beginning of 2021. Um, and my thinking was because I couldn't get over to the US, let me get that US experience. And I think there's so many companies doing that now. I mean, BDO, for example, uh, we have an offshore division in uh, South Africa that's purely related to what's called the PCOB, which is the public jobs. Um, so there's certainly a lot of opportunities out there to, to start getting that experience. So I thought, hey, even though I can't move to the US, let me go and start getting that experience, start creating those uh, connections. Um, so I actually had a very successful time with with Sapro and I was outsourced to, I mentioned DHG. Uh, they loved me and they actually wanted to hire me on uh, full time uh, at the time. Um, but fortunately for me, I had been uh, going back a few years, our office managing partner here in Tampa at BDO is a guy, uh, Thiru Govinda, uh, who's actually originally from South Africa um, and through various other people who had come over to the US uh, he had heard about me and I'd actually come and had dinner with him in 2019 when I was uh, here visiting. Um, so through that, we had been in contact. Um, and then basically at the end of 2021, he sent me a WhatsApp one day saying, hey, we have an opportunity for you. Am I interested? Uh, I think the next day I was on the phone. Uh, a few weeks later, I was getting my visa. Um, and yeah, in January, I arrived here um, of 2022. 
And what was that visa process like? Uh, did it take a long time? I've been I've been to the U.S. Embassy in Durban, in, interesting place. Uh, so tell us about that. Yeah, so so my my visa uh, situation was quite interesting at the time. So initially, South Africa, um, as many people know, especially during COVID, were banned from various countries around the world, and especially from the U.S. Um, so I actually I signed my contract um thinking that the embassy was open and south africans could travel to the us literally the next day after i signed the contract um the us put a ban on south africa um and we weren't going to be able to get my visa so i was absolutely shattered because i went from this high of finally being able to move to the us to being told hey we can't get a visa there's no appointments um so i initially actually booked to get a visa in kenya and we were going to fly to kenya uh, to get my visa uh, and then two days before I was meant to fly to Kenya, the Kenyan embassy canceled our appointment. Um, so I landed up doing my visa in Cape Town about two weeks later. Um, and fortunately, the one thing is when you're coming over from any of the big accounting firms or any international firm, I did what's called an intercompany transfer. Um, and especially working with a company like BDO, um, it's not the first time they're doing this. They have you know, good people involved. Uh, to help facilitate that process. So once I had the appointment, I got my visa pretty much uh, You get approved that day uh, and I flew pretty much the next week. Um, so the time to actually get that initial visa is not that difficult. It's just getting an appointment, especially uh, during the, you know, the time of, of when I was trying to get it with all the bands. Um, but yeah, BDO is just super helpful. They've got a great team uh, in the US who are dedicated to that um, and just, gave me all the necessary resources that I needed. I remember last year when I was trying to get an appointment at the, I had to book one for like three months in advance or three, three that's how fully booked it was. So that, that, that is, a, that is definitely a problem. For sure. If, if somebody is thinking about, okay, they South African, they may be a CA, maybe not yet a CA and they want to move to the U S where, what advice, where should they start? What advice do you have for them? I wish I could just employ every South African. Hey, that would that, <laughs> uh, that would be the easiest. Uh, but no, that's that's honestly the hardest part is finding someone in. Obviously, especially when you're sitting in South Africa, to find a job here in the US is is by far the hardest thing. Um, and for me, um, I spent months trying to find someone who sponsored me here uh, via LinkedIn. I messaged every person under the sun. I try to message other people working at companies who were CA essays, um, but that's probably the hardest thing um, to do. So my advice to people is always, if you're working in, a, in an audit firm at the moment in South Africa, uh, or you're thinking about uh, if should you go into an audit firm or not, uh, go into that audit firm, do your articles there, get the necessary experience, and then move within that firm uh, to the uh, to the US. Um, because that's pretty much the easiest way to get over here in terms of the visas. Um, the US is very sticky on the type of visas you can have. Um, so if you have, if you're working at a, a large accounting firm, that's the easiest way. Um, otherwise, if you don't, um, if you can't necessarily do that, or you finished your articles and you're trying to now f figure out the best way, uh, like I said, go. If I was you, I would go and work uh, for one of the dedicated centers in South Africa, whether it's BDO, whether it's Sapro, McCorsey, start getting that experience, uh, embracing those opportunities, building those uh, connections. And then from there, see if you can obviously show, um, you know, your necessary skills um, and then uh, have them uh, facilitate that move. Um, and then also, I guess, maybe something else that I think I'm seeing more and more recently is like, um, I always say to people, don't be scared to to kind of put the the US on pause a little bit. So whether that means going to Europe for a year, going to Cayman Islands, Australia, get the international experience somewhere else uh, at an auditing firm, and then you can do the jump uh, to the US. Because sometimes, um, you know, that gives you even better opportunities, um, having that additional international experience on your CV. And what's the work like uh, compared to, the, to South Africa? Did it take a long time for you to adapt? Um, <sighs> that's a good question for sure. Uh, I came in and literally at the busiest time of the year. So I arrived in January um, and most accounting firms, and this was the same when I worked with DHG, but now at BDO, we have generally 
about a 55 hour week in, in busy season. Sure. Um, so it, it seems long, but the whole team is doing it. Everyone's doing it. Uh, and when I think back to my article days, it was no different. When I added up all my overtime that I did, um, you know, it was it was nothing nothing different. Uh, but in terms of adapting to the work, um, I think having certainly in my case, uh, and I think in many CASA's cases, you have such a good foundation underneath you. So when it comes to dealing with people, dealing with difficult situations, liaising with the clients, um, you know, if you've done your articles in South Africa, you've really set yourself up for for success. So I think. Most South Africans who come over here uh, find it quite easy uh, to adapt uh, to to the way people work over here. And, and generally, South Africans uh, that have come over here have been very, very successful. I see there's quite a few questions coming through from the audience. So I thought, let me rather just jump over there quickly so that we can answer as, as many as we can. We've got a question from Casey who says, so if you do move between states, do you need to write the exam again? Or is your CPA designation transferable between states? Um, okay, so depending, and again, uh, you, you can fact check me on this, but uh, definitely depending on this, um, the state you're going to move to, um, they have different requirements. Um, so if you're moving, say, from Florida to New York, depending on the New York requirements, you may be e able to easily transfer it, and most states are like that. Um, some states may require you to take an additional ethics exam uh, or whatever it may be. But generally, uh, you don't need to write the exam again. You can just transfer from one state to another with maybe some uh, additional requirements. And we've got a question from Tokozisi who says, how long do you have to be under a sponsor visa before you can become a permanent resident? And do you still love audit? And is that the reason why you still audit? Or is, there, or is it situational? How difficult uh, is it to move out of audit? Lots of questions there. So I'll, I'll let you jump in and decide which one you want to answer first. Uh, no, uh, let's go for it. I mean, these are, are common questions I get, and we were talking just before this, and I, I said to you, you know, get quite a lot of these. So the first thing is how long um, before you become a permanent resident. Uh, so that's dependent on the company. So uh, if you're on a L1 visa like I am, uh, those are temporary visas, so you still need them to sponsor your green card um, after that. Um, so the visa, the L1 can either be five years in total or seven years, depending if you're an L1A or L1B, which is one's a managerial one and one's a skills visa. Um, so it's really dependent on the company uh, for them to sponsor you, uh, your green card. And that usually, that, that can happen concurrently. So once you're on your L1 visa, you can do um, your permanent residency. And that takes, at the moment, probably in excess of, of three years um, to do that. And then the second thing is, do I still love audits? Um, and is that the reason why you're still in audit or is there a situation, how difficult is it to move out of audit? Um, so yes, I still love audit. That's why I did the US CPA. Um, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have done the CPA if I wasn't going to be in audit. Um, you know, that's, there's, I think, significant career opportunities with an audit. Um, it's been a great way, and I always said this in my article, is a great way to learn how businesses do things in South Africa, and it's the same way being an audit over here. Uh, every day I'm learning new things, learning about different clients, building my network, um, and that's that's a big reason why I'm still doing audits. And then in terms of moving out of audits, uh, that's just dependent on your visa um, and where you are um, and how long you've, you've been at the company. So there's no easy answer to say, hey, I'm going to come over here and move out of audit. Uh, you certainly, uh, generally, your, your visas is tied to, your, to the, the work you're doing. That's great. I think that covers it. We've got a question from Pasetsana who says, did you complete your CTA with UNISA as well? And were you ever disadvantaged in any way with having studied with UNISA? Uh, yep. So I did my CTA with uh, UNISA. Um, I studied the three-year undergrad program and then the one-year postgrad. Uh, I was never disadvantaged anyway trying to come to the U.S. Um, I know, I think in South Africa, at one stage, some of the big four kind of look more highly at, say, UCT or, or Stellenbosch or Vitz, wherever it might be. Uh, but I never had any any real disadvantages. And to stay up, I also did my CTA at UNISA, so... I don't think it's a problem, but yeah. Then we've got another question from uh, another question from Casey who says, 
are there different exams to be written if you are a non-CA, but you've done the qualifications to be able to sit for the boards? Um, are there different exams to be written if you're a non-CA? So I'm assuming uh, you said there was an ethics exam. Would there be more exams or something to that effect? Uh, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I mean, certainly in Florida, uh, for me to register, I literally, once, you, once I was a CASA, I was registered for 12 months um as a CASA and then I took the regulation exam um and I guess Casey maybe to help you and the rest of the audience there's some really good resources online um if you just uh google otherwise maybe we can share somehow in the chat after this um some of the links and I actually wrote a LinkedIn post a little while ago about converting the the, the qualification have a look at that LinkedIn that, that LinkedIn post I've read it as well it will definitely help it'll definitely help answer some of your questions I think that's it from questions from the audience. Is there anything uh, that uh, you'd like to mention or anything from your side that we didn't chat about? Um, I think for me, the biggest thing is, um, and we were talking earlier about this is, you know, I get a lot of questions from people about moving over here. Should they do it? Shouldn't they do it? Should they go to the UK? You know, should they go to Australia? Where should they go? Um, and I think for me, the biggest thing is that if you, if you're looking to move abroad, go for it. Don't, don't hold, you know, don't be nervous about going abroad, whether it's you want to go permanently, whether you want to do a short term secondment, absolutely go for it. There's so many CA essays around the world. I can almost guarantee you wherever you go in the world, you're going to find one. Um, but don't be scared. You have the necessary skills. You have the necessary uh, foundation underneath you and, and you will be successful, you know, overseas for sure. Um, if that's something you, you want to pursue. I think that's a, a, a great way to end. The show has been live on YouTube and should be available on podcast by tomorrow. If you're watching on YouTube or listening on the podcast and you feel that it's added value, don't forget to like, subscribe, and click on that notification bell to get automatically notified when the next episode comes out. Travis, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, everyone, for joining us for another episode of Two Ways to Skin a Cat. Goodbye.